Fakatakate Hokite Uru, Fakatakate Hokite Tonga, Kiama Kina Kina Kiuta, Kiama Taratara Kitai, Ehia Keana de Atakura, Ehio, Ehuka, Ehauhu, Homie, Huye, Taikie. So kia ora everyone, welcome. I just just a quick karakia to bring us all together in this space and in the spirit of this final session of the BSANS conference. Um, you know, amazing to make it to the last session of a conference in the last month of this very interesting year. And so I'm really glad that you can all be here and that we can all be here together. And so just calling us all together in this really exciting time. Um, so my name is Nina Wirika. As Sarah mentioned, I'm the cataloging librarian at Auckland War Memorial Museum, Tamaki Paengahira. Uh, so I am responsible for sort of the um, bibliographic metadata, all the metadata related to books um, for incoming material, especially. Um, but I also look at sort of heritage publications and rare books. Um, the mountains of my ancestors are Mount Fuji in Japan and Mount Taranaki here in New Zealand. And uh, the waters of my ancestors flow through the Waitara River and the southern seas of Japan. So acknowledging them and also acknowledging, um, of course, the indigenous peoples all around the world from wherever you're watching. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge the Manafinua of Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, um, and the sort of Taumata of Auckland Museum, which are Ngati Paua, uh, Ngati Fatua Orake, and Tainui Waka. And of course, the Ghana people of um, Adelaide, where this conference is being hosted. So the um, beautiful image that you see on the right hand side of your screen there is from the traditional knowledge labels. Um, if any of you haven't seen those, I'd recommend checking them out. They're a really cool way of labeling indigenous knowledge um, according to indigenous um, ways of knowing. So there's seasonal knowledge, there's clan knowledge, restricted knowledge, and they've got all of these labels. But this particular one is the um, traditional knowledge label for multiple communities. And I thought that bring, I'd bring that into the sort of online space to acknowledge that, you know, whatever power dynamics exist in the physical world are transferred through to the digital universe. It's a, it's a place of multiple communities and it needs to be activated and protected as such. So acknowledging the indigenous space within the online community as well. So kia ora everyone. So this is going to be a whistle stop tour of anti-racism and cataloging policy. And I'm really excited to be sharing this particularly this year with everything that's been happening. Um, so the brief outline of this presentation will start by talking about anti-racism, what I, what I mean when I say that. Um, then we'll look at the anatomy of a cataloging policy, which I promise is more interesting than it sounds. <laughs> and then we'll look at activating a policy at the end. So to get cracking, um, I think it's good to iron out those um, questions over what it actually means when we talk about a racist policy and anti-racist policy, racism and anti-racism. And so to do that, I've got this very simple structure um, that um, Ibram X. Kendi uses. So Professor Kendi is a, an anti-racism scholar based in the United States. And he's got this really good framework for sort of looking at um, racism and anti-racism. And so, well, um, it's based around this fundamental measure of equity, right? So um, a sort of equity, racial equity, looks like different racial groups having approximately the same footing. So you can look at, for example, home ownership, you know, medium income, professional roles, you can look at um, educational attainment, there's a whole lot of different areas in which we can measure racial equity. And so racial equity looks like two or more racial groups having approximately equal footing and racial inequity, on the other hand, is not having the same footing. So you can see that, for example, in incarceration rates in New Zealand, right? So those are the measures that we use is something that we're doing, sort of maintaining or producing equity or inequity between racial groups. And one thing that Kendi brings forward that's really useful is sort of this idea that policies will either be sort of maintaining or producing racial equity, or they'll be maintaining and producing racial inequity. And so a racist policy is one that um, maintains and produces inequity between groups. So you can think about existing inequities that are around. So, you know, access to libraries, you can look at, um, yeah, once again, incarceration, home ownership, these things, or you have a policy that maintains or produces racial equity between groups. Um, and it's important to note, I think, when we look at these words racism and anti-racism, it's really confronting, you know, you don't want to be called a racist. It's become kind of this label, this really negative personality characteristic that you attach to someone when you say they're racist. But Kendi sort of talks about bringing that back out of the personal and saying, this is actually a really useful way to analyze an action. You know, you can be um, doing something that contributes to racial inequity one moment, and then contribute to racial equity the next moment. You can be racist one moment and anti-racist the next moment. And so by using it more as a tool for analysis than as like a slap on the face for someone, it's a really useful way to get the conversation going and also allow people to be flexible. 
So I know that's a lot to go through, so we'll just sort of um, churn it over in the next few slides. So sit back and stay with me. <laughs> so when we talk about these racist and anti-racist policies, it's not just those formal documents that are written in these sort of, you know, signed off by the director, that sort of um, written document, but Kendi sort of mentions that these policies are written and unwritten, they're rules, procedures, processes, regulations, and guidelines that govern people. So every one of us who's here today will at some point have interacted with a lot of policies, you know, to do with our institution or to do with the um, institutions that we associate with our banks, um, our libraries, right? And Kendi makes a really good point here that there is no such thing as a race neutral policy. You know, either your policy is contributing towards equity or it's contributing to inequity, right? And there's this idea that if you're not acting, you're either maintaining or increasing in equity or you're maintaining and increasing in inequity. And so there's this idea of looking at the actions that we do and saying, is this contributing to racial equity? Is this contributing to racial inequity? And not sort of leaving anything out and saying, well, this doesn't count because it's not about race. Um, so yeah, here we are. Every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation is producing and sustaining either racial inequity or racial equity. So just to sort of hammer that home here, when we're talking about a race, racist policy, we're talking about a policy that sustains or produces racial inequity. When we talk about an anti-racist policy, we're talking about a policy that produces or sustains racial equity. And so that might sound a bit abstract, so I thought I'd bring it into the bibliographic universe. So this is what it looks like in terms of um, people who are working with books, right? What are these measures of racial equity and inequity that we can look at? So physical access to libraries, collections, reading rooms, intellectual access in terms of being able to access things from your worldview, um, language access. Um, I know that's something that can definitely be measured. You know, are things written in indigenous languages and can things be found in indigenous languages as well? I think, you know, there's um, access points. Um, there's representation, who are we seeing? You know, what, what do our collections represent? Whose stories? Um, educa educational attainment is of course, you know, as if you're involved with schools or universities, how do you interact with those racial inequities that do exist? And then um, research and authorship, you know, the way you create your data and the way you sort of advertise your collections can lead to different opportunities um, for different groups of people. And so the research and authorship aspect is something that you can manage in the way that you create data and the way you communicate collections across to academics. Um, so th these are just, you know, a few of the ideas I had around different measures that we can think about when we think about our actions as people who work with books, right? Do they contribute to equity in these areas or do they maintain or contribute to inequity in these areas? And so um, bringing this into the world of cataloging policies, you know, cataloging policy is a way of looking at your role within an institution and saying, okay, well, you know, how can I contribute to equity in my area? And I, this is a, an interesting analogy. It's the only one I've been able to come up with. So bear with me, but it's, kind of like um, spreading the jam. And so I think of jam as these sort of equity processes that we have in place. So in an institution, for example, you could have an anti-harassment policy, you could have a, you know, a diversity and inclusion policy, and they sort of sit in their own areas as clumps of jam on this toast. And the idea with a sort of a policy um, for your individual area is to take that jam and say, okay, well, this actually applies to me. I'm gonna spread it to my area of this piece of toast and um, really sort of embed those values into the work that I do. And so it's bringing those unwritten procedures, you know, these policies that Kendi talks about and sort of making them overt and saying, well, does this contribute to equity and how can I make it so that it does? And so cataloging policy is about documenting what you do essentially, you know, it's about what standards you use, you know, what um, consistency you're following. You know, are you using RDA? Do you put your books on WorldCat, for example, um, you're looking at your procedures, the way that you process books. And it's really just taking data creators, people who create data around books in your organization and sort of activating them and putting them directly in the context of these equity movements within you know, the policies that your institution has around making people feel welcome and sort of taking that jam and just embedding it into, into the roles that we have as metadata creators. So I'll talk a bit more about what that looks like. Um, but first, who's going to read it? Essentially, no one. <laughs> so um, a cataloging policy is not your good Friday night read. You know, it's not a, a juicy novel. It's very specialized. And the main goal of it really is to get institutional buy-in and to produce 
a waka or a vehicle through which you can start doing transformative work. Um, so yeah, it's not going to be a New York Times bestseller. Um, it's, it's really just to create this internal process I and mean, to start sort of distributing and um, sort of increasing the accountability throughout the organization for this work of equity. So just to give you guys an example, this is what the contents of our cataloging policy looks like. So we've got a definition of terms, we've got a mission and vision, you know, the purpose, who it applies to, the basic principles we follow, you know, review periods. So it's kind of similar to a normal policy. Um, but I've also, I've highlighted here the ones that um, directly talk to this idea of racial equity. So creating an anti-racist policy, one that either produces or sustains racial equity, right? And so going through a few of these, the first is this the spreading of jam that I'm talking about. Once again, I will find a better analogy at some point, <laughs> but this idea of taking all of the jam that your institution has in certain areas and applying it to your role. So at Auckland Museum, we have Hekwarahi Māori, which is our Māori dimension, and Te Leva, which is our Pacific dimension, right? And so in the cataloging policy, we've said, okay, well, we want our cataloging to align with these two things. So we're going to pay particular attention to issues of cultural sensitivity and representation as an integral part of cataloging practice. So that's taking the jam that's available and spreading it into our role, occupying that piece of um, toast with something that's very active. We also have cataloging aims. So these are the goals that we have when we're cataloging, you know, taking a step back from creating the data and saying, well, what are we doing this for? And so you can see we've got, you know, clear, consistent data, the spreading the jam, which is the alignment with values and policies. We also have a whakapapa section. And so as Matua Loki was talking about um, at the keynote speech on Monday, you know, these having these names, for example, in Maori newspapers is incredibly important for people trying to find their whakapapa. And that's an area of inequity, I think, at the moment where a lot of um, Māori knowledge contributors and early Māori knowledge hasn't been catalogued to that level of names. Um, and so that's an area where we're saying, well, if you come across these names or things that might be important for whakapapa, take that extra time and write them in. And so an example of this on Monday, I was cataloging a, I think it was um, an international fishing organization guidelines of traditional tokelau and fishing. And using the Pacific dimension strategy, and using the whakapapa section of this cataloging policy, I took that extra 10 minutes to write down the names of all of the Tokelauan fishing masters who'd actually contributed the knowledge to this book. And so a record that previously would have only had the name of the person who came in and documented those practices now has the names of the knowledge holders who actually created that or contributed that knowledge. And so that's sort of leading to the equity of, you know, indigenous knowledge holders being represented, you know, this the idea that this author field maybe isn't enough. And that comes from these cataloging aims. We also created a 4.9, um, so that's within the cataloging aims, we added this one on the end, which is to sort of directly acknowledge that our collections might contain harmful material and material that could hurt people, you know, when they're looking through our catalog if they don't have context. And so this, this aim, 4.9, it was drafted over and over again. It was sort of made in collaboration with a lot of different people. And it says that, you know, it's actually our business to care about um, the sort of stereotypical prejudicial language. And it's our business to, I guess, address it and figure out how to address it and work towards be best practice in addressing this sort of material within our collections. So now I don't have much time left, so I'm just going to whip through activation here. So writing a cataloging policy, you know, you, there are a lot of them around. I'm happy to contribute ours if you need um, sort of ideas. Um, but, you know, that essentially gives you the space to start doing this work around equity, to look at your collections and say, how is our data either contributing to this inequity or contributing to equity? And so um, how you activate that policy is entirely up to you. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest things to do is to talk to knowledge holders and people who um, you know, have a stake in this and who have been underrepresented to see what that would look like for them. Um, but it also gives you a chance to just take that extra five minutes within your cataloging practice and say, actually, it's important to create these indigenous metadata points. You know, that comes from this policy as well. You could also get into spreading the jam through other institutional areas. So, you know, I'm working on in inclusive writing guidelines at the moment. So that's sort of looking at a museum-wide communication strategy and um, also looking at sort of content warnings for collections online to acknowledge the harmful material that we have. So the activation of this policy can go in a myriad of different directions. Um, and so it's really the start of sort of work, not the end of it, but I think, the idea of the cataloging policy is to once again come back to this, this idea of, you know, are we contributing to equity 
or are we contributing to inequity or sustaining either of those? And embedding our practice within that context and saying, you know, it's not enough to be neutral anymore. You know, we need to start thinking about outcomes for different groups of people and how we can start to make those more even. Um, so that's just finally a few, few links if you're interested in some of the things that you can do to activate your policy. Um, we wrote a guide on how to use Māori subject headings recently with our Mataranga Māori advisor. Um, so that's in there as well. Ethical toolkits for cataloging is beautiful homosaurus page for LGBT linked data. Um, so there's a myriad of directions that you can take this and I'm really excited to sort of hear from all of you if you have any questions. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you so much, Nina, for a very thorough, interesting, fascinating talk and very detailed. So much food for thought uh, in your presentation. There has been some chat and during your session and also a number of questions. Um, some really interesting comments in the chat. Uh, people saying, this is fascinating, Nina, thank you so much. And also people who mentioned your beautiful introduction. Um, I do have a question from Andrew. This might be the same as the question I have too. Um, he's asked, how does 4.9 work in practice? For example, our institution has a huge amount of racist images in our databases. Mm. So that's an area where I think 4.9 for us provides a place to start looking for best practice. And so one of the things we did, you know, because we have this racist material as well, and I think I mentioned in my brief for this session, you know, the transcription of the N word came up quite soon after this policy was written. Um, and so looking at what other institutions are doing, I looked at the naming project in Canada where they actually take offensive metadata and put it in a, a not public field. Um, so it's still findable, but um, it doesn't show up, for example. And in project naming, they took stereotypical and offensive images and asked knowledge holders who, you know, were involved, you know, or who had ancestors who were depicted to actually come in and write more accurate descriptions. So, of course, that was a really huge project and there's been a lot written about it. But I think 4.9 does two things. It allows you to, or it gives you, um, you the sort of institutional space to research best practice. And then I think it also gives you the space to say this is a priority and we need to, you know, we can't just um, go by this and say that we're, you know, it, it's, it's too long, it's too complicated. No, it's a time to stop and say, we need to address this as part of our routine and integral cataloging work. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely, depending on what the offense is about, it's about consulting those communities. It's about doing a wide range of research, but it's definitely about saying that this is a cataloging aim that we have as an institution is to sort of address that work. Thank you. And just to add to that, I wondered what you think of the notion of adding a disclaimer. So if there's something that could be deemed offensive, um, is it appropriate to add a disclaimer and say something like, we know this is this could be offensive, but it's it reflects the attitudes of the times? Is, yeah. that, is that appropriate or not? You know, like what's been happening with films and so on that have been been um, cancelled and then um, I think Gone with the Wind um, has a yeah. disclaimer or something added to it now? So I think that's that's a really interesting point. And we talked about that a lot with the N-word um, when mm -hmm. it was it was in this field that we would routinely transcribe and it was, you know, an important part of sort of the history of this work. You know, we can't whitewash these histories and we can't sort of say that these this language wasn't around and this harm wasn't around to people. Um, but when we were talking about the N-word, um, having it in a collections online catalogue where a school kid could come across it mm -hmm. with no context, you know, where an institution has put that word out there and put this, you know, that association out there without something to say this isn't appropriate, yeah. um, would in fact be harmful. So it's about balancing that accountability we have towards these problematic and racist collections with this idea of what happens if a child comes across this with no context. So I absolutely think that that disclaimer and putting that context in is really important. Great, thank you. I've got two more questions in the Q&A. Catherine has asked, has use of your collection increased by Maori and Pacific users since implementing this policy? Um, so uh, due to COVID, it's sort of been delayed in its implementation. So it's only been around for a few months. Um, so I think it's too early to start looking at that data yet. I'd also say it's 
combining with a lot of different jam projects around the museum. So if uh, you know any momentum comes from those users, it will be due to the language that uh, the work that's happening in the area of language and access. Um, we recently launched our bilingual collections online platform, so it's totally translated into Te Reo Māori. So it'll be hard to measure the sort of impact in that area, but I think day to day, just looking at the the metadata I'm creating, the care I'm taking to write out those extra names if I have to, it's it's making a difference in those small ways. Thank you. And we've got one more question. We might need to make this our final. There's actually two more questions now. Um, all right, well, we'll answer these two questions quickly if possible. Um, yes. Adria has said, thank you, thank you so much, Nina. What LMS do you use? And have you had to customise it much to apply your new processes to it? Um, so we actually use InMagic. So that's a DB Textworks database. Um, that's looking, we're looking at some sort of movement around that at the moment. Um, so I think one of the biggest areas in which we're trying to adjust the LMS to fit the model is with the traditional knowledge labels. So the Auckland Museum has a working group around that and how to implement those knowledge labels as they work for sort of Maori knowledge um, and in collaboration with Atoma Da Iwi. So that's an area in which we're looking at that. But at the moment, we've got a very traditional LMS with no modifications. Thank 